money. They say it can't buy happiness, but it can buy jelly beans, and that's almost the same thing. So what do you need to know about how Cloud Firestore works to make sure you're not spending too much money? How's it different than real-time database? And did I just make that jelly beans remark so I could be eating jelly beans in the next scene? Let's find out on this episode of Get to Know Cloud Firestore. These are good. Do you want one? Mm-mm. They're delicious. So, I think a lot of folks coming in from real-time database land might be wondering where the automatic, hey, just migrate my entire database to Cloud Firestore button is. And the truth is, we don't have that button. I don't know if we ever will. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, thanks to a lot of the things I talked about in the last video, shallow queries and the ability to run queries across multiple fields, you can structure your data in Cloud Firestore in a way that probably makes a lot more sense logically. And some of the workarounds you had in the real-time database world, like combo fields or unnecessarily shallow trees, aren't really needed anymore. But two, the way these two databases determine pricing is very different. And if you take your entire app that's optimized for one pricing model and stick it into a completely different pricing model, you might end up spending more than you needed. And that means less jelly beans for everybody, and that would be sad. So let's talk about pricing. And before I do, let me hit you up with a quick disclaimer to make our lawyers happy. <clears throat> Please note that all pricing guidelines and examples in this video are used only for demonstration purposes and may not reflect your full and accurate Cloud Firestore pricing. Your app's needs are unique and might not benefit from the recommendations laid out in this video. Be sure to review the full documentation on the Cloud Firestore website for a more complete sense of Cloud Firestore pricing and to best determine which pricing strategies are right for you. Wow, that was exciting. So if you're coming here from real-time database land, you're probably used to having most of your costs be proportional to the amount of data that you download and upload to the database. Cloud Firestore is different. When it comes to pricing, it cares less about the amount of data you download and more about the number of operations you perform. More specifically, Firestore primarily charges based on the number of reads, writes, and deletes you perform in the database. But what is a read or a write? It seems obvious, but let's go into this a little further. So writes are charged whenever you create or update a document. And this holds true no matter how much of that document you're changing. Whether you're changing a single field from true to false or swapping out 30 different fields all at once, it still just counts as one write. A read occurs anytime a client gets data from a document. So if I say, hey, Cloud Firestore, give me the top 20 Japanese restaurants in my area, and Firestore gives me back 20 documents, that will count as 20 reads. And the nice thing here is only the documents that are retrieved are counted. If you remember from our last video, Firestore does all of its searching through indexes, not the documents themselves. So even if I have 30 million restaurants to search through, asking for the top 20 Japanese restaurants in my city still only results in 20 reads. On the other hand, if I were to say, hey, show me all the restaurants in my city, that could result in a boatload of reads and honestly, probably more than I need. That's one big reason why pagination is important, and we will talk about that in a future video. Also keep in mind that these reads apply to real-time updates as well. Every new update my client receives also counts as a read, but only for the document that's changed. For example, let's say I've got a real-time listener set up for these top 20 Japanese restaurants. Now, if one of these restaurants suddenly changes their name, that new document will be sent to my client and that will count as a read, but it only counts as one document read. And this is true even though in my listener method, I'll still get all 20 documents. Firestore is smart enough to merge that one new document alongside the cache data that hasn't changed. Oh, who's a smart little database? Yes, you are. So that's all generally good news, but let's look at a situation where things might get a little pricier. Suppose instead of my restaurant app, I have a stock ticker app where I'm updating the price of every stock on the back end every 15 seconds. And imagine somebody has my app open in the foreground and they're following one single stock symbol. Well, if they keep their app open for three minutes, that app will receive about 12 updates, which counts as 12 reads. And if that person is following 10 different stock symbols, well, we're now up to 120 reads for that user's three minute session. And my gosh, if I have like a thousand different users all using my app at that time, well, that's 120,000 reads right there just for those three minutes. I mean, if I were to keep up that pace, that averages out to like 57 and a half million reads a day. And wait, wait, are you freaking out? Stop, stop, calm down. It's okay, breathe into a paper bag or something. You see, I get it. We're engineers here. We're all about calculating the big O of things and seeing exactly how big stuff can scale. And if we see that the number of reads scales proportionally to like stocks times users times updates, that does scare us because we can see exactly how big this could get in a worst case scenario. But things aren't always as bad as they first appear. Let's go back to our stock app. If we've got a thousand different users all using our app for a three minute session, well, that works out to roughly half a million daily active users. And those 57 million daily reads, that's gonna cost us about like $34 a day. 
And honestly, if you're paying $34 a day for an auto-syncing multi-region database with half a million DAU, that's not so bad. And there are clearly ways I could limit this if I needed to, right? I could reduce how often I update these stock prices, make it a pull to refresh situation, or extreme cases, maybe not this one, set up a caching layer. So I don't want you to automatically panic at the worst case scenario, but I do want you to be aware of the cases in which Cod Firestore could make you panic. As a general rule, I like to say that the more real-timey and the more crowded an app feels, the more it will probably cost in Cloud Firestore land. So let's go back to our restaurant review app. This is really about delivering large chunks of data fairly infrequently. As a user, I might run a search and that could bring in 20 documents and maybe I drill down to see details on one of these restaurants and that might fetch in the 10 most recent reviews. But these documents, they're not gonna be updated very often. And these reads are gonna be pretty infrequent because you know even skimming reviews takes time. Writes are also gonna be pretty infrequent because it takes a pretty long time to compose a restaurant review. Even if my app auto-saved a draft every like 30 seconds, that's gonna be pretty small potatoes in the grand scheme of things. So I think my restaurant app is probably set up pretty nicely to take advantage of Firestore's pricing model. The same would go for anything like a blog, a wiki, or maybe a news app. Cloud Firestore might also work well with a turn-based multiplayer game. If you think about it, a typical turn in a board game usually takes a couple of minutes. So using Cloud Firestore to power a multiplayer chess game or a word game would probably be pretty reasonable. Cromulent? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a real word. Now on the other hand, imagine you've got a group whiteboard app where lots of people all get to scribble on the same canvas at the same time. If you're sending tiny updates at the rate of several times a second for that real-time drawing feel, you're gonna generate a lot of writes and a lot of reads per second. And this might be one case where the real-time database would be better suited to the situation, at least from a pricing standpoint. Okay, now what about a chat app? Well, this gets interesting because this is something that could vary wildly because the number of reads is very much affected by the number of people in the same chat room. Let's think about a one-on-one -on -one chat. If we assume that every person sends a chat message every 10 seconds, two people chatting for five minutes will generate about 60 writes and 120 reads. So if I take 100 people and group them into 50 different one-on-one -on -one chats, I'm looking at 3,000 writes, 6,000 reads, and that's pretty reasonable. So if you want to use Cloud Firestore to power person-to-person -person chat in a dating app, or maybe let users chat with customer service representatives, that'd probably work out pretty nicely. On the other hand, what if we took those same 100 people all still chatting away at the same rate and put them all in the same room where everybody could hear each other? Well, now all 100 people get an update whenever anybody writes a message. So I still have those same 3,000 writes, but now instead of 6,000 reads, I have 300,000 reads, which is a pretty big jump. But even that estimate is probably misleading because it turns out that when you get into a chat room that crowded, people tend not to chat at the same. Would you be quiet? I am working on a video for YouTube. As I was saying, people tend to not chat at the same rate as before, it just gets too noisy. And if the main lesson you're getting out of all of this is that it's hard to provide heuristics or guidelines that work in every situation, hey, then congratulations, you're getting it. You really are gonna have to look at your own ass behavior and figure it out from there. Now, while we're here, let's talk about a few things that might affect reads or writes that you might not expect. First up is cloud functions. As you know, these things can also read or write to the database, and when they do, that gets billed. Suppose I've got a cloud function that updates my average score in my restaurant app whenever somebody creates or updates a restaurant review. Seems reasonable, but what if I decide that I was gonna calculate the average rating by gathering up all the reviews in the review subcollection, reading in every review score, and then writing the average back to the original restaurant document? I'm hoping this is generating some alarm bells in the back of your head, right? Because this is gonna generate a whole bunch of extra reads that you might not wanna perform every single time a user changes a review. I think it'd be better to use some clever math. Like if you store an average review and a number of reviews value on that restaurant document, then you could change the average for a new review without having to go back through all the other review documents. Or if you really like the idea of writing a function that looks at every review for a restaurant, at least make it a cron job that runs only once every few days. Another thing to look out for is security rules. They can generate extra reads in your database too. I know I haven't really talked about security rules yet, that'll be covered in a separate video, but when it comes to evaluating whether or not a certain action is permitted, sometimes you'll need to check an arbitrary document in the database. These are checks you'll usually be making with get or exist calls, and these two calls typically count as an extra read. That said, Cloud Firestore is pretty smart about caching these values when it can, and in practice, security rules are probably gonna be much less of a concern than cloud functions when it comes to pricing. Sure, an operation might trigger an extra read or two with security rules, but it won't scale dramatically the way a badly written cloud function might. This is definitely an area where you're better off optimizing for you know, security instead of getting overly clever in some quest to minimize database reads. In fact, as a general rule, I'd be careful about overly optimizing for pricing. While you definitely wanna avoid any boneheaded maneuvers that will drastically 
basically drive up costs, I've also seen some pretty convoluted schemes out there where developers will spend hours creating overly complex code that ends up saving them like, you know, 30 cents a day. Remember, your development and debugging time costs money too. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Sorry, rant over. So let's look at a few other places where Cloud Firestore can cost you money. I've generally ignored bandwidth costs in this video, and that's because while there can be a cost associated with outbound network usage, or what we like to call network egress, which it turns out is not a type of bird, it's generally a very minor factor in the grand scheme of things. Like, I think you get the first 30 gigabytes of data for free, and for most larger customers, this ends up being like 4% of their bill. So I tend not to worry about network usage too much. Similarly, there's a cost for storing data in the database, and this includes not just your data, but also the indexes and metadata that goes along with it. But again, this is pretty cheap, roughly 41 times cheaper than what you'd be paying in the real-time database. So in general, it tends to be not as much of a factor in your pricing. And this cheaper storage, in fact, means you can look at doing things that might have been too expensive to be practical in real-time database land. For instance, every time my user decides to update the review for a restaurant, I could totally save that revision as a completely new document and keep the old ones around. Then my user could go back and revisit every single revision they've ever made. Sure, maybe that's a little overkill for a restaurant review site, but it'd be really useful in like a blogging site. Also, if I wanted to store an icon or small profile picture for every user, I could totally do that right there in the database without having to look at a separate service. Remember, Cloud Firestore supports storage of binary objects as values, so I could keep a small JPEG or ping file in there. Now keep in mind, you're limited to one meg per document, but you know what, for a small icon, I think it'd be fine here. So now that you know what you're gonna be charged for, let's talk about measuring and estimating costs. Cause I think all of us worry whether you're on Cloud Firestore, any other cloud service, or just running your own backend, there's gonna be some error in our code or badly thought out architecture that's gonna end up flooding our service without our realizing it. So while it's certainly important whether a service is cheap or expensive, sometimes what matters more is that it's measurable and predictable. And I will say the nice thing about looking at reads and writes as your main pricing factor is that estimating those is a heck of a lot easier than estimating download sizes, especially because you can limit the number of items that get returned from a query. So like I can easily set up my app to return only the top 20 results when I perform a search, and then I know exactly how much that search is gonna cost. It would be way weirder to ask it to limit my results to the top two meg worth of restaurant data. I, I don't even know what that would look like. But outside of estimating costs, let's take a look at how you can get details on your actual real world usage and get warnings if things seem out of whack. And I'll be honest here, this is an area where I find things are a little rough around the edges and I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some nice improvements over the next several months. But let's say your app has been out for a while and you're curious if your reads and writes match up with what you're expecting. How would you find this out? Well, to get this data, you're gonna to need to get out of the Firebase console and jump into the Google Cloud console. You see, every Cloud Firestore database that you create is attached to an App Engine project, which means that if you want to see your database usage, you'll want to go to the Google Cloud Console at this URL here, and then select App Engine, and then head over to the Quotas page. You'll be presented with a bunch of different usage stats. The three you're most interested in are these three here, Firestore Read Operations, Firestore Entity Writes, and Firestore Entity Deletes. And then for storage costs, you're going to want to look at Firestore Stored Data. And this can give you a pretty good idea of what your usage looks like. If you click on history here, you'll see a list of your usage costs over the last 90 days. And if you click on any of these numbers, you'll get the exact breakdown of your usage. And then maybe more importantly, over here in App Engine settings, you can set up a daily limit on spending. By setting this daily limit, if Firestore costs ever get over this threshold, then the API will start refusing requests. Now, admittedly, this isn't a thing you wanna have happen on a regular basis. And so my recommendation here is set this to a point where you're like, yeah, if I ever reach this kind of level, something's definitely wrong. Put the brakes on until I can fix it. Then, you know, make it a habit of coming back to this page every once in a while. Look at how your costs are doing historically, and then adjust your limit to something that might be more accurate based on your previous levels. Oh, and keep in mind that if you're on the Firebase Flame plan, which is like the fixed price per month plan, then it's essentially doing this already for you and setting these daily quotas isn't necessary. Sure, it's nice to look at the summary to see what your actual usage is like, but you can kind of ignore these costs since they're covered by your flat fee. But if you are on the Blaze plan, which is the pay-as-you-go plan, another step I strongly recommend is to give yourself a monthly budget alert. If you go to the billing section of the Google Cloud Console, you have this option here to create a budget. Basically, this is your way of telling Google, hey, this is kind of the most I expect to spend per month on all your cloud services, so I want you to tell me if I start to get close to this limit. Now, unlike the daily quota limits in App Engine, this won't turn off anything if you exceed your budget, but it will send you a somewhat frantic sounding email so that you can go and check out your usage to see what's going on. 
So because of this, I'd recommend setting your budget much closer to what you might reasonably expect to see in a busy month. There's a lot less harm in hitting a false positive here. Just remember, the app engine spending limit is a daily thing. The budget alerts are a monthly thing. Don't get them mixed up. Also, these budget alerts cover all Google Cloud services, not just Firestore. So like your cloud storage or cloud function costs are also included in there too. Finally, another tool I would keep an eye on is StackDriver. It's a very cool little monitoring service that can track your app's usage of a number of different cloud services, both on Google Cloud and AWS. You can set it up to present you with some really nice looking graphs and have it send you alerts if things start to look off in a number of different areas. For instance, we recently added support for the real-time database. So now StackDriver can tell me if the amount of data I'm sending in the real-time database goes over a certain limit or if it's getting too many or too few requests. It can let me know if my cloud functions are taking too long to run, and it can let me know if there's an unusual increase in any of these stats. That said, there's not a lot you can do with it yet with Cloud Firestore, but I wouldn't be surprised if that changed in the future. I'm not promising anything. I have no idea what their roadmap is. I'm just saying it wouldn't surprise me. The same way, say, a second jar of jelly beans wouldn't surprise me. Anyone? Okay, fine. So there you go, kids. Just about everything you want to know, and probably some stuff you didn't, about pricing in Cloud Firestore. Like I said, refer to the docs for all the latest pricing information and to keep me on our lawyer's good side. He looks cute. He can actually be pretty vicious. And I'll see you soon on another episode of Get to Know Cloud Firestore. Cheers. Oh, oh I got buttered popcorn. That's a weird one. Want to trade?